so I, I'm going to keep it really casual and maybe I'll just start um, going through like the basics of call options and, and the concepts we talk about in the articles. And then maybe we can get a lot deeper into like strategies that people would do and um, a little bit about risk and, and pricing the options itself. Uh, so maybe I'll just screen share so I have stuff up. Do you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. So this is the this is just the first article. So call options are basically the oh and sorry and anytime you have questions just jump in. I, I want to keep more like a discussion. Um, so call options are basically just um, the the right, but not the obligation, to buy an asset at a at a specified price, and a specific time period. Um, Kevin, would you mind enlarging your screen a little bit? I can't actually read what's in your screen. Oh, really? Does this help? Yes, that's so much better. Thank you. Great. Uh, so it's basically the, the right to buy something at a, at a certain price and, and before a certain time, or sorry, at, and at a specific time. So there's so there's um there's a few as through the, through our article there was a couple of there's a couple of um specifications of call options that we defined and the the ones where we call european style options are basically options where they you can only have that right at the expiry time and whereas there's there's options called american options which give you the right to buy that asset um throughout the time of of, of the uh, of the option so it doesn't have to be that one point in time um, for the American options. It could be basically any time before expiry. Um, so that was one of the specifications of, of our of our option. And then there's another specification of options where normally when you think of an option in the traditional finance world, say you have an option to buy like Tesla at a certain price. Um, when you when you reach that expiry time and you execute that option, normally what happens is you actually bring in your cash and buy that stock at that price. And then you take, you take ownership of the stock. Whereas there's this, where there's an alternative method where, which we're, we're looking at is basically a cash settlement where you just only care about the difference that you make. So if Tesla, say if Tesla's um, strike is a hundred and Tesla was at 200, then you basically make that hundred dollars. And, in, and you don't need to actually bring in your cash to buy Tesla stock. And instead, you're just paid that difference. Um, so those are the so that's the difference between the cash settlement and physical settlement. Um, and I would say those those are probably the biggest types of um, variability in, in how options are, are kind of specified. And um, and then and then the, the main thing is just really the asset. You know, what, what's the asset that, that we're dealing with? So in in our ex example. Um, Sorry, Kevin. Yeah. Like, I just just while we're on settlement type and yeah option type, um, I like open options. They're also European and cash settlement, right? Yes, I believe so. Are there any protocols Actually, wait. Like there in that aren't those like um, that that combination that are like American or physical? I actually um, think open. I think, I think open that. actually. Yeah, I think they change between V one and V two, Kevin. I forget which is which. That's right. Uh, I think from v American to European. Actually, I think V two is American. V two. I think it's European. European. Oh, sorry, V1 was yeah. American. Yeah, I remember the switch, but I forgot which one, which way it was. I think that's right. And then most, and I usually think of like I started just brought Darabit. So Darabit would basically be the same kind of structure that we're creating, which is cash settlement and European, I believe. Uh, and I'll have that up later. Um, so I don't know if I want to go through all the examples, but you know, in our example, we had basically ETH, um, an ETH call struck at 2000. Um, Somebody would pay a premium of 5% uh, of an ETH, 
and then we we went through examples of, of different things of, of, sorry, of different scenarios where you know if ETH traded above or if ETH traded below, you know what would happen. Um, generally, the, the payout of it was defined as the max between the settle price and the strike price divided by the strike price. So I found that this was a little bit complicated to some people when I had some questions about it. Um, so I kind of I just I decided to just create a payout chart. So I just did this on on Uma. So if we had created a 40 call on Uma, I I showed two different ways of <clears throat> of of showing. Actually, is this big enough for everybody? No. No. Uh, is there a way to zoom in? Top left. Right there. Is that better? But you can't see everything now, right? How's that? Can everybody see that? Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so normally, when you think about call options in your traditional finance, like you would have this is this would be a a, a call in UMA at forty. So your payout on the call, if you sorry, if the pre, if the option costs you nothing, then you would you would basically have no exposure to UMA all the way from zero to forty, and then at forty, then you start making you start making money on your call. Basically, just it's the difference between the price of UMA and then the strike price. In this case, our strike price is forty. So this is like the traditional kind of um, payout that you would see um, when you when you think about call options uh, and in textbooks. So when we when we use UMA as the actual payout for, for what you're receiving, or effectively using the same asset as the underlying asset, then it starts to look, it just looks different. But the, the, the economics would be the same if you effectively can sell UMA at each of those prices. So if we translate to like 100 on UMA and, and 100 on this, uh, and, and uh, between the two different, uh, two different ways of payouts, if you, if you, if it was a traditional call, it would basically be you made sixty dollars if you had a forty strike and Uma was a hundred. In this case, you would be given. Let me get the exact numbers. You would be given 0.6, oh, let's see, 0.6 of an Uma, and then you could basically sell that Uma that you receive, and you get back the sixty dollars effectively. But we're paying, but in our payouts, it's all an Uma. So as you can see in the payout, it's 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 a function where it basically approaches one as it as it, as Uma goes to infinity. So, sorry, but the payout, yeah. what's the sorry? What's the difference? What's the difference between the what well, is so the first one, graph and then the second graph? The first graph would basically be you're you're being paid instead of being paid in U.S. dollars for your call option. You're being you're being paid in UMA for your call option, mm. okay. right? So each, so the the payout function was um, was was um, the settlement price minus the strike price divided by the settlement price. So basically, the price of the asset minus the strike price divided by the price of the asset, and that basically creates this payout right here in in UMA terms. So here you're getting paid in dollars below, and in up here you're getting paid in UMA above, but they translate economically the same thing if you could sell UMA at the same price as, a, as, as, as they see where you expire. Gotcha. Um, so that was like a big, that was a, that was the thing that I think a lot of people started asking questions about and got me a little bit confused about. Um, so, and that makes, by doing this, it made, it makes our, it makes the options very clean because in this case, if you collateralize each option by just one UMA, you'll always be collateralized. They may not be efficient, but then they'll cover all scenarios. Whereas if in this case, if you collateralize with US dollars, then as, as the call option starts, as, as UMA starts to rally in price, then you, the, the seller of the call option would have to keep putting in more and more US dollars to back it as collateral. Um, so that's why the design was basically done with, with just 
um, the asset itself being the collateral for for the option. Kevin, yeah, yeah. I, I just have a like quick question about like the yeah. the second case, which is like you know kind of more efficient as you said. So in that case, like options are obviously like their prices are like I think generally more volatile then um maybe i'm wrong about that but i would imagine that options generally are more volatile than the underlying um or usually like especially if they're like more in the money but um so like does that mean that could you see a contract like our emp contract where you have to kind of basically like just have basically margin sitting above the price of the option and having some sort of way to price the option. Do you see that being like a workable strategy or do you think you'd have to over collateralize it so much to account for the volatility that it would be like, that it wouldn't really work? Oh, so if we, sorry, if we, if we did this, the bottom scenario and we right. made our collateral US dollars. Sure, um, yep. Or you could like do the top scenario and still collateralize in UMA, but like potentially yeah. collateralize in more UMA yes. as you get closer, which is kind of like what market makers in re like on in fiat the fiat world do to hedge if i understand yep. correctly that's kind of right. what they do is they 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 cover their calls more and more as it gets closer to end the money um, yeah I, I think we can't you you could do you could collateralize with like us dollars um but under the decentralized framework the current framework now like yeah people would probably be be worried about liquidation because because you would start collateralizing early. Say, for example, right now, like we're we're far away from from forty dollars on Uma right now. Right. So the amount to collateralize your option is is fairly little right now. Right. But then the value of the option will start to increase if you start moving towards forty quite rapidly. Um. So then, so then there's a there's a lot of fear in that case of like you know if people aren't watching their positions properly, then then there'll be a lot of liquidations as that occurs. Um, so I think with in the options world, I think if you're if you're like an options trader and you're on a centralized exchange, um, then you probably are watching this a lot more closely. And the centralized exchanges also have some claim on your on your assets or, or some kind of margin, or or, or they, basically, they basically they have some kind of recourse to you. Um, whereas like in, in the DeFi world, they don't. So right. then it's so I think. People probably over collateralize themselves more, but we could certainly, in the case with using the the underlying asset um, as the payout, sorry, using the underlying asset as, as collateral, you could definitely. Th I think there's definitely cases where you should be able to be more capital efficient. Interesting, um, right? Like, like we could, we clearly don't need one UMA to cover all scenarios because we're like in in this case, like for, for an April expert, we wouldn't expect. We wouldn't expect you to go to 200, I guess. What well, I mean, it could, but so so meaning like at least you could cut off certain scenarios, right? And right. you wouldn't care unless Uma was at 100, maybe that before you start suggesting that there's possibly a 200. But there's still a lot of time for that to occur. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely possible for us to make it more capital efficient. But this is like version one, version one, I guess. Yeah, and you could and you could even make the contract like work perfectly. I guess if you like made the contract itself cap out, like you could actually cap the, you could make it a slightly, like not exactly an option, but actually cap the payout of the option out at like 200 or 100. Yes. It would basically be the same product, but there's like a, you're removing that tail risk to allow the collateralization ratio to get a lot better. Exactly. Like we could do a half a NUMA and cap it out at like, I don't know, whatever this is like $75 or whatever it was. And yeah. so it ends up being like, they would call it like a, like a call spread. Effectively. Right. Yep. Right. So, so you would, the, the strategy would be you had you had sold, so you would be buying a call at forty and selling a call at at like seventy five. Yep. Um, and people would know that that's that's the payout. Um, but yeah, it'll be that it'll be definitely more capital efficient in things we could consider. Cool. Sorry. Thanks for that. Uh, for that tangent, I appreciate. Oh it. no no no. Yeah, I I encourage that because I rather I rather answer questions. Um, kind of uh, in that way. Kev, I added one more thing to what, like, basically, Matt, if you make our contracts super, if you and the engineering team can make our contracts uh, and bots, like, our bots super effective and liquidations really capital efficient, then we can totally under collateral, like, less collateralize these things. It's just a matter of, like, how well our liquidation infrastructure works. 
working on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to move into like actually just going through some real, like basically more specifically on what we're, what we're going to be releasing hopefully on Monday. Um, well, the specs may not be exactly the same, but I want to talk more about like um, what, if we create an UMA option, UMA option, what people can do with it and, um, and kind of like the strategies around it and, and why, why this is being created. Um, actually, are there any more questions and, and just the specifications and, and how, how it works? Um, and or maybe one thing we touched, like, do people understand why, like, so I guess going through that, you, I guess there's, there's, there's a little bit of implied that um, thing that we're, we're, because everything is fully collateralized with one, one UMA backs an entire call option, then there's, there's a cool, the, the neat thing about it is that we don't need actually liquidation bots to really monitor this because it's, it's collateralized. Um, so one of the things that we, we've done, and the engineers uh, know, all, know about this already, but one of the things we've done is basically we were, we've, ex, we've kind of disabled the ability to withdraw collateral. Um, and we could we um, disable the ability to, to allow people to liquidate other people as well. And effectively, what we've done is instead of having the usual liveness period of, of two hours, we've extended that liveness period to basically to some time period that's past the expiry. So if anybody tried to pull collateral out or they tried to liquidate somebody, um, they would basically just wait. It would just they would just be stuck waiting until after expiry. And by expiry time, then, then the contracts would just settle. Um, but effectively having this one UMA for one call option um, takes away the need for, for, for bots to, to really be in there. Um, I had a question about pricing. Yes. So often with, and I'm going to put aside AMMs because I'm sure we'll discuss the issues with that in a little bit. But normally in options markets, you have both puts and calls and coming between the two of those, there's like a parity that is reached where if you hold like both a put and a call, it can result in like net exposures holding the underlying, if I remember correctly. But in yeah. any case, the point is that there's an arbitrage between the puts and the calls that is like quite influential in pricing them. So in this scenario though, we only have calls. So my question yeah. is, what is the impact of only having like sort of one side of this parity on pricing? Does it mean that in general, they will be overpriced what they would have been otherwise? And like, Overall, how does price discovery work when there's only calls being sold? Yeah, um, no, that's a good question. Um, I don't think we actually even thought about um, using like a put call parity to actually bound or, or, or to help guide pricing. Um, so this is definitely more of an experiment. Um, so effectively, I, I think what you're saying is like, um, for the for everyone else, like if if you basically you could basically replicate uh, the underlying the underlying asset by effectively um, buying a call, sorry, uh, buying a call and selling sorry buying a call and selling a, a put, right? Or basically so, yeah. you, you can reverse it around by selling a put. With it, or, or sort of buying a put and, and selling a call. So, and then the components of that basically make, make can, the components of that all equal together and that helps with the pricing. I, you know, I think that's, I think that's really helpful and it, help, it makes the market more efficient. Um, the only way that we're thinking about pricing is just really using like a, like a Black-Scholes model and, and just telling people using a Black-Scholes model and using like, Using some kind of boundary as a guide, um, so maybe maybe I can talk a bit about that uh, if that helps. Because I remember David, I think this whole post this whole thing started with David asking the question about how how options are, or how that how is that premium priced, I guess. Um, and then maybe from there, we can think about ideas of like you know how do we improve that or how does how do we make how can people price things better off of that simple kind of framework? Does that, does that maybe start a good start, Chris? 
Yeah, for sure. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to jump right into the no, weeds. It's just... I, I think that's, that's important because I, I remember not, there's a whole reason that I don't, I don't want to leave this thing and, and not have David's question answered. Um, so so if you, you can even do this yourself right now. Uh, I was just messing around the internet and, and you can find basically Black Scholes calculators. And Black Scholes is basically the, the equation that most people would use when they think about pricing options. Um, so, you sh so this is the one that I've, that I've used. Um, and I don't even know if, it's, if this is like the best one out there, but it's, they're all pretty standard. So it's like goodcalculators.com, Black Scholes. And what, what the model effectively does is it's, um, I, don't actually, I don't actually have the equation here, but it, it basically, there's, there's a model that was derived uh, you know, back in the 80s, I believe. And people have used it to basically price options. And the and just to kind of make simplify it, really generalize and simplify it, all you really need is this the this the uh, price of the asset. So in this case, we'll I'll use 40 on Uma. Oh, sorry, the price of that sorry, Uma is like 20 with the 24 today. And then the strike price, which we'll use 40, and then the time to expiry, so we're using an end of April kind of uh expiry. So it's I'm just gonna say 50 days. Or something like that, and then volatility we'll we'll come back to, and then a risk free rate. Um, and I, I'm assuming a risk free rate of what an UMA asset would return. So so for these two numbers, we actually don't really have um, a clear idea of UMA in particular. And what this volatility number means is is that if you think about the value of an option, really the the main value of an option is how volatile that asset is. The more volatile that asset is, then the more valuable your, your option is. Because you know, if the asset moves around a lot, then you rather you rather have that kind of limited downside um, exposure to that asset instead of, instead of having to own that asset. So the volatility is basically the main driver of an option's price. And people would call that like the implied volatility of an option. And if you look at, in, and if we think about, you know, um, UMA itself, you know, UMA, <clears throat> UMA is like, or so if you think about uh, markets that are out there that we can compare it to, like, UMA is part of the Ethereum um, chain, the network, and Ethereum is probably the most kind of like standard asset or, or kind of like a base asset that people can compare things to. You know, if you think about Ethereum, Ethereum is probably, is probably the most liquid, and it it's, it, every, every other, token kind of that's in the system probably should trade with some kind of beta to Ethereum. So if, if Ethereum's going up or down, you know, UMA's probably moving along with it in some ways in general, most of the times. So if we start looking at Ethereum, we could probably make some assumptions for what UMA would trade like. So if you go to Deribit, for example, this is this is basically Deribit's um, option screen. Uh, and we can actually look at an April 30th Ethereum um, options. And is this everything really small for you guys? I'm guessing. Yep. Yeah, let me boost it up a bit. So there's a lot of numbers. Is this better? Kind of? Yeah. Okay. So then they would have strikes right in the middle. So this is for Ethereum prices. So right now Ethereum that's 1770. So this is like kind of close to what we call like at the money. So then on this side we have calls on on the left side, and then we have puts on the right side. So they're quoted in the same way that we're going to be quoting our options, basically as um, a fraction of an Ethereum. So if you so for example, if you bought a call or you've wanted to buy a call at 1760, which is kind of like really close to where the market is right now, you would basically be paying somewhere around like 17 and a half percent of an of an of, a, of an Ethereum to get that call. Um, and then as you move on, you can see the different strikes, and then the, these are all the different prices. And obviously, as as you go further away from the money, like you say you have a 3200 ETH call, then you're paying like you know just under three percent of an ETH. To buy that call, and this expires on April 30th. So with these, and this is like a limit order book. So then there's people, there's machines, and they're bidding and offering these things out there. So using that, 
they can actually use the Black-Scholes formula and go backwards and figure out what that implied volatility is. So these are the numbers of implied volatility right here. So what effectively what that means is that if you bought, if you are buying this call option, it is implying, and this is sorry, this is an annualized number, it is implying that Ethereum can move 111% over the year. Is effectively what what that means. In in sorry, in a one standard deviation move would be 111%. Um, and every option you could basically back out that number by using the, the Black Scholes formula to do that. So if we think about um, UMA, you know, we like Kevin. Would, can I ask a yeah. question about this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, these are all different options, right? Yeah, going down the list, like different. Yeah. Why do you think? That, why does the implied volatility like go up as you, like monotonically as you like move between strikes? Or I think these are different strikes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because like, the, shouldn't they be like roughly the same? Well, not necessarily, right? So like, actually, heart heart might need to check on this. Is this is this called skew heart? That's the smile, yeah. right? That's the sorry, the black show smile. The black show. What's black. that? Is it called skew when when like so when you when when the implieds are different, like as you move further out? Uh, yeah, I think like I, think I don't actually. I think it's that, yeah. Be, be like like volatility is higher um, out of the money than it is at the money. Yeah. Right. And, and that's yeah. skew. So, right. So basically, what normally happens is is people. Like you, you can't, it's hard to imply, sorry, think about this way. Like if you drew, if you thought about like, um, if you thought about the distribution of, of the price of UMA, um, most, the model, the models would imply, would, would use like a, a normal distribution, right? Of like, you know, where, where the UMA price is. So, you know, the, with the normal distribution, you know, most, the, most of the outcomes are, are kind of centered around the mean. But in reality, in, in real life, the, those tails are not, are probably bigger than a normal distribution, right? Because, you know, there's a possibility that, that, some, that something further happens. Out. It's like usually st like stock prices or, or, or crypto prices or token prices are not really normally distributed, right? If you think about it in, in, in real life, it's not, it doesn't act exactly to that model. So what ends up happening is <clears throat> there's a slight premium in that implied volatility for things further out. Because one, I don't think anybody really wants to sell that tail to people, right? So like, there might be a guy who's, I'm just being, make, I'm, make, I'm kind of making this really more generalized, but like, if there might be a person who's, who stays very much, believes in, in like Ethereum going, going to like 3840, but there might not be a lot of people that want to sell you that tail option, right? Because it's only, it's only the guy who sells that who sells that option is only going to get 1.7% of an ETH, right? To sell you basically a lottery ticket. So there's a lot of times where there's there's these I think they're, they're called fatter tails where people will be charging more or paying up for premium to get these kind of further strikes because of that leverage you also get too. So that's why it's not fully the same throughout that uh, throughout the strikes, right? So so it sounds like what you're saying, or at least part of what you're saying, is that it's like it is these fat tails these that 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 the the implied volatility comes out of a assumption of normal distribution but it's not but that's like a bad like not a perfect assumption and then right. i think the second thing you make like a, another kind of compounding argument that like that like because the markets are thinner and because it's like more difficult like the risk is like maybe more difficult to price at those along those tails like it's really it's like the the outcomes are um are like more extreme so it's difficult to know how much money you're going to lose if you if you were to lose money on these that right. like that like people are maybe market making further out like they're they're putting a bigger spread between their bid and ask because they're more nervous because they, they want to give you worse prices because they're they're more nervous about those price points yeah i think in some cases that's right like i'm 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 not i wasn't an options trader but like I'm probably getting some terminology wrong somewhere, but like that's I, I believe that's the general theme of it and the general idea of it of how the distribution works, and also like how 
you think about just risk reward in in what people are paying for for options or willing to sell options for further out. Makes sense. All right, but it it, is, it looks like the the size is the largest at the furthest out of the money uh, ask side. Is that right? It's like that one there, right at the bottom right of that here. column. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. That's just really interesting because like each each strike price is a different order book, right? Like it's a different set of liquidity, different yes. sets of, of right. orders. Right. That's right. Um, I'm not sure why exactly the size is that much bigger. There there could be an aggregation problem here, Chris, where like where like because of the structure of the market, like they're not offering any strikes above five thousand. So maybe right. there are a bunch of people who want like. 5,500 and 6,000 or whatever, but they ha they're forced into that 5,000 band because there's nothing higher. Yeah, yeah that's a possibility. Sense. But I guess you can the see- Liquidity the seems so yeah. fractured. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm looking at the volumes, like I guess things are just a little bit out of the money are probably the most exciting to trade. But yeah, but, but even like at the money, the volume seemed low. I'm not even sure what time frame this is. But anyways, yeah. So, I, the, so going back to um, what I was really just discussing. So we're so using Ethereum kind of as your base, kind of helps. Like maybe the question would be like to the group. I guess maybe it's like like a simple question. Like you know, where do you think do you think UMA is more volatile or less volatile than Ethereum? I yeah, think more uh, volatile. Sorry. It's less volatile a lot of the time, and then it's really volatile for like three day stretches. <laughs> That's actually true, but uh, but yeah, I think in general, but, but given that, right, it probably nets being more volatile. I think because then you have these kind of yeah. unpredictable outcomes that occur. Like you could be like just winding up and maybe tracking Ethereum, and all of a sudden it just pops or or, or, or collapses. Um, so basically, we, thinking about pricing, I thought that. A simple way to price it would basically use using use Ethereum as your base, and then think about a spread on top of that. And then we're, I'm really we're really just hacking this, but like you would I would think that it has to imply volatility has to be at least Ethereum, and then you would put something on top of that. And then the last component we had, which is not really that interesting, if if we looked at if we looked at uh, we need an uh, like a risk-free kind of rate for our asset. I thought that maybe just something, if you looked at Aave or Compound for Ethereum, and I guess in the future we'll have Aave for, for um, UMA, you would just put a rate there. And I think Ethereum is, pr is pretty low in terms of risk-free rate. So if you looked at anywhere from the borrow to the, the borrow rate to the uh, lend rate, I'd, I'd say like, you know, something like a 1% is, is fair. But none of this really does, it doesn't really move the, move it that much. Wouldn't the like average uh, reward emission rate be a good risk-free rate because that's like native to the holding UMA? Like if, like because it's meant to be like other places you could, ri without risk, allocate that that asset. Like obviously there's not there is risk in voting, but yeah, I don't know. It could be a good proxy. Yeah, maybe. Is but then, it, but then like in, in reality, the economics of, of our it's really an inflation reward. So I'd always find that it's not really like if it's efficient, it shouldn't have it shouldn't really be a return. Right now it is because our price doesn't really move with rewards. But anyways, yeah. Sorry, was but somebody else? I was just gonna oh. ask yeah, I was gonna ask like, is the risk free rate the rate that you can earn on the underlying asset of the option, or is it the risk free rate you can earn in any asset uh, in the ecosystem, or is it like and then what are you comparing it to? Like risk-free rate of this, the return of this thing? Because I think also the denominator matters, right? Like 1%, yeah. like you were saying, inflationary rewards don't matter. But if UMA is naturally like expected to return over USD, right? Then, then like maybe that's what you're comparing your risk-free rate against. But it kind of matters what you're comparing against to like determine if there is, yeah. if you actually are earning interest or if you're actually not earning anything, you're just changing the denomination. Right. Um, yeah, I, we, I kind of debated that with Hart and, and and a few other people. I don't really know exactly what exactly what, like this is kind of built in a way that's 
it's thought more about in traditional finance. So everyone has a base currency. Um, but in this sense, and, and usually sorry, and, and usually the collateral on the margin is, is just like that base currency. Whereas in, in, in our sense here, in the crypto world, it's not clear what the base currency is all the time. Um, so I just assumed, I just basically assumed um, just the underlying asset and what it could and, and what it could return if you were to lend it or if you were to lend it out. I see. So, but, but, but what you're saying is like, it could be just as reasonable to say like USDC on Ethereum is like another reasonable like base asset or maybe like if ETH on Ethereum is also a reasonable yeah. base asset too. I think it's, yeah, I think, and it's, I think it's based on your collateral that, that we're thinking about. So I see maybe it's base currency. Yeah. And so the base currency is UMA. And yeah, and, and another thing is we, this is all new kind of, so we've been kind of just messing around with things. So it's, I don't know, I don't know, I don't have the full answer. I think I'm, I, my answers are not fully confident on everything. Gotcha. Fair um, enough. But I would say, I would, I'm making the assumption that it's my under, it's my collateral and the underlying pricing, underlying price, or in, in the price denomination of UMA. So everything would be just basically what you would earn, or what, what would be the borrowing lend rate for UMA effectively to drive it. Um, Okay, so with with those components in, so now we're using a, a very conservative volatility number. Then you can use this calculator and click calculate. I hope that works. Wait, did we, go through, did we go yeah. through the dividend yield? Did you already talk about that? Or did I miss that? Oh, sorry. There's no dividend. Um, I'm assuming there's no dividend in this thing. Gotcha. Okay, fair yeah. enough. And sorry, and, and you know what? These actually dividend might matter, but the risk-free rate doesn't, some of these components don't actually matter that much. Um, but they're really the big drivers of volatility, remember. Wait, did that actually move? Let me just make sure. Okay, it does move. What did I say, 115? So you, with that, you could actually click calculate and you get a price. And this is in in dollars or like, yeah, whatever whatever metric we're using. So so we're using, we're using UMA USD, right? So if you take that 73, divided by 24, then basically it would say that it would be 3% of a NUMA would be the price of this option. And then we could basically adjust this number and you know, say you've adjusted to like 150% or something like that. Then, then you can see that that price moves. And then that would be 6.7%. So I think that's the idea of how I think you should think about the pricing to start. Um, and there could be other methods, but like, I think this is probably the one of the easier, uh, easier or, or in, more, more intuitive things to think about when, when looking at it. And then if you get more time, you can actually play a little bit more around here to get a better understanding of how things change. Um, it's a cool thing. So these, are, these, so then, when people talk about Greeks, for example, these are all the different risks that people have. Um, I'm going to show you something here. Okay. So, so basically, this this is called the delta, this green line. This is the value. Sorry, this is the value of the option. This is a delta, and the delta is basically your exposure to UMA as the call option as the call option moves. So, if you think about where we are, where are we now? Okay, so so this is the price of UMA right here. This is how much exposure to UMA you have as the price rises with this call option. So if you held one call option and the price of UMA is at, um, you know, this is stupid. Hold on. I'm not sure there. Great, that's better. So this is, so for example, this is the price of UMA right now. So that, that means that at this moment in time, your, your risk to UMA is basically 0.27 of an UMA for one call option. 
a 0.28 of a new muscle one call option. But as you see, as you get closer, as the market rallies, your exposure to UMA starts to go up with that call option. And as you get to the strike, then your delta or your exposure to UMA is basically 60%. So that kind of goes back to what we were saying about how, how as, as, as the price moves closer, um, your delta starts to change. I think Matt, what you, what you were bringing up about, about how we collateralize, right, versus, versus uh, the price. For, 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 for how you collateralize if you had to use USDC. So you can see that your, your risk starts to accelerate as you get closer. And your exposure basically starts to rise and it moves faster. By the way, I think it's I think it's actually a, a fairly interesting and illustrative example here. This is what when everybody talks about, I don't know if you've all heard about this like whole Robin Hood thing where like the Wall Street bets people like basically like tried to trick like basically like tried to uh, they push the price of GameStop up. This is effectively what they did. They were squeezing, they were like using this exact method to like squeeze the people who sold them the options to hedging out their positions by buying more and more of the stock. So as you continue, as the price goes up, these people who sold the options, because your risk goes up as Kevin's talking about, they have to buy more of the stock to hedge out that this aggregate exposure. And so which further pushes the price up. So it's like a vicious cycle where they, where they created this like kind of positive price spiral. Um, by forcing the option sellers to like, by pushing the price up and then forcing the option sellers to keep buying. Um, so like, this is right. that exact, it's like an illustrative example of this exact process happening in the real world. Right, right. That makes sense. So like in, in, in like, kind of like in finance terms, like when you're long the option, you have like positive convexity. It's kind of what you call it. Like where the, where, where the option value is in your favor and, and things start moving in your way. Right. So like price moves up, your risk moves up. And whereas the opposite position is the person who short the option is like he's negatively convex. So I guess convex meaning like the shape of the curve, I guess. So then so then your your risk starts going the wrong way. Right. So then as as price goes up, they get shorter and shorter, the market. Right. So so that's kind of yeah, it's it's, it's basically that's it kind of is a reflect reflection of you know what your your exposure is when you when you own or, or sell options. Um, just for the interest of time, I wanted to touch on like, sorry, is there are there any questions on any, any of this stuff? And and you can go in very in a lot of detail if you play around with these calculators, um, and you can really get lost in yourself in it. So, but but I kind of we probably shouldn't go through every every kind of item here. Is there any questions? I'm I'm really curious to hear about like AMMs and how that fits into this, and like uh, the issues that okay. comes around that. Yeah. Um, so with AMMs, this is those kind of like more in the first article. Um, so the pro the main problem that 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 um, that we have with 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 options is that there's like with with normal assets in an AMM. There's usually a value to those assets, right? Like, so if you have two two assets in a pool, um, they they always maintain some kind of value, and even if if they go up and down, you, you'll have a permanent loss. And generally, you know, generally it's 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 it's, it's a kind of, it's kind of like a stomach like it's it's a risk that you can kind of like understand in stomach. But the, the issue with with options is that it is going to be known that there's there will be times where that one of the assets being the option itself will actually go to zero because it, it just becomes worthless. And with AMMs, that doesn't work very well because in, an, in a traditional 50-50 AMM, you're always matching the value, the, 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 asset, the total asset value of each side. So if one asset goes to zero, then that means the other asset has to go to zero to match that in order for this, the, the rule of the AMM to work. So that causes a big problem because if you pull some call options in there and you provide some some like uh, UMA or say like ETH, some kind of some kind of other asset to pool against it, if your option went to zero, you as a liquidity provider, you lose basically all of your other asset, and and you would end up having basically nothing. Um, so that's the general problem with with um, using AMMs for options. There's, so for us, 
and this is just just an illustration of imperfect loss right here. You can see it generally if you're if you're within this range, it's generally okay. And even if the market rallies a lot, like you know, the, it seems like the most you're you're really losing is maybe twenty five percent, and that's a, with an asset multiplying by five times. But if your asset go one of your assets go to zero, then effectively everything the whole you lose everything. Um, so one of the one of the things that we've to to kind of prevent this or think to work around this, there are two things that that you could do. Um, one is that you could just basically allow the pool to, to trade, but before sometime before expiry, you just start pulling out your liquidity, and then and then you basically prevent that impermanent loss because usually the option is worth something um, before expiry because there's always, always an option value. It could be very far out of the money, but there might be some kind of residual value. So you're trying to basically avoid this this massive drop in value when it goes to basically zero. So pulling out your liquidity early is one thing you could do. And then the other thing that we had thought about doing was really just putting some kind of residual value in your option. So instead of having a payout that was going to give you that, that exact clean payout of the settlement price, mass strike price by the selling price, you could actually add in like plus like 0.1 or something like that. Like so in our UMA scenario scenario, you could have an option that always gives you 0.1 of an UMA back to you. So in that case, you will never go to zero. Um, and then there'll be some kind of value in the pool. And, and then that basically protects the, the liquidity provider. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more messy because when you have to explain, all, ex explain that to, to the public and, and, and have them understand this, this residual, residual piece there. Um, so we kind of avoided that. And, and, and you would also have to collateralize a little bit more. So instead of, having, instead of having one UMA, you would have to have 1.1 UMA in there. Um, so yeah, so, so that's a possibility as well. But we thought that that was a little bit messy. Could, so could what you achieve we, the same yeah. thing using uh, an AMM that has more than two assets in it? So if you had like an option, a stable, and then something else, I don't know, like in a balance of pool, I'm not sure if yeah, that would work out. So, that's a possibility, I, and I don't know, and I don't exactly know how that would work. Like, if one of the assets went to zero, does what happens to the other two in like a three token? I guess it's three. the same thing. You just end up holding the token yeah. that goes to zero. Just yeah, my understanding is that you'd end up with like a one way of the other two assets, and then like tons of the token. Yeah, so it's the same thing. Yeah, I I want to mention one thing I discussed yeah. with Art, and I like. Like another like potential potential reason this is not a problem, and I don't know if yeah. this actually works. So I'd, I'd actually love feedback on it. Yeah. So what you have to, mechanically what you have to do to drive the price to zero in an AMM pool is you have to put in tons of the option, and as we all yeah. know, like the price is moving away from you exponentially. So basically, what you're doing is like you have this pool, and it has like let's say a hundred options and a hundred UMA in it, right? Yeah. As you st what, what you're asking people to do to drive it to zero is they need to start dumping more and more options into the pool. Now that works great for like a while um, where people like all the options that, that Uma minted and everybody else, all that stuff gets dumped into the pool, right? If the options go into zero, everybody's just dumping it into the pool and taking, their, taking the loss, right? But at right. some point, like to keep driving the price closer and closer to zero, you need to mint new options, right? You need to put new options yeah. in circulation to keep driving the price down. And at some point it becomes like extremely capital if inefficient to pay one UMA, so pay like 30 bucks to sell an option that's worth like a cent, right? Or like half yeah. a cent. And so you'd have to create, you have to dump like millions of dollars of capital in to make like, at some point to make like a hundred bucks, you'd have to be putting in a million dollars worth of money yeah. to make a little bit of money. So yeah. I don't know if, I don't know how the math actually works out on this and like how close to zero it would be efficient to get to. But at some point, it just becomes not worth your time or your money to like extract that last amount of value by dumping more options into this option into this pool. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Um, yeah, but I, I, yeah, I guess we don't know what happens in practice. But yeah, I, there's it, you're never going to get it fully to zero, for sure. Um, so yeah, so that's why we feel it's it does seem like, like we're not we don't have it fully thought out. I guess putting it out there, but like, but you're right. I, I don't think anyone can actually take that pool to zero. But then in that sense, I also feel it's it looks kind of inefficient. 
anyways, this, this is like the first version. I, I don't think it's it's not like ideal. I don't think anyone's really solved this problem completely yet. Um, but I think it's gonna be a good experiment to see to see how people react. Um, and I think we might we'll probably have some liquidity in there, but we probably will reduce a good amount of liquidity um, as we get closer. I think, and we're warning we're gonna warn people about that. Um, but yeah, so so this is like using AMM, so like, which is why like all these other other option protocols have been doing other things, and um, and creating like liquidity like option writing liquidity pools um, and stuff like that. We're just making uh, limit order books instead uh, in, in doing something completely different. Um, but that's the essence of, of the problem is, is this, the, the token option, whether the option value goes to zero. Maybe Uniswap V3 will have like a min price in it or something. Yeah, yeah. like I think you could do something interesting with the bonding curves where you somehow just change. Yeah, you, you change it or, or bound certain things. Um, but yeah, there, there must be a lot of different things you can think about doing. Or maybe you just completely change so, so we've been thinking about um, we've been discussing with another uh, with a couple of guys about about using um, uh, like balancer and, and, and using more than two tokens. So maybe you can structure in a way where I'm not sure exactly, but like basically, if if you can somehow create the option values to offset each other and put in the call. Anyways, it's, it's it's yeah, it's 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 not an easy problem, but we're we're definitely thinking about it more. Um, I guess this time's going by fast here. So, there's, is there any other? Actually, I, I should leave it to you guys. Are there topics that you guys want to touch on? And, it, and Chris, does that does that kind of touch on that topic, or do you want to talk more about it? Yeah, I think sufficiently given we got five minutes left. Yeah, but there any anything that people want to talk about? I could talk a bit about what um, people can do if we create this UMA option. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if everyone's read, read like the second part of the article, but I, I think it's gonna be really, I, I'm quite excited about it because I, I like the idea of having, having um, people be able to do things with their UMA tokens and you know the the call option itself is is very simple if you just buy it. You know, there's so now if we create a UMA call option, people can own the upside of UMA um, by paying like a fraction of an UMA, right? So they're they're basically it's a levered, limited downside type of instrument that you can that you can trade to own UMA. So that's that's pretty straightforward, and and then people could definitely do that. But what I think is going to be interesting is if if we now allow our token holders to actually earn yield by selling UMA call options or creating a, or, or adding to the UMA pool of, 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 of options. And so what I mean by that is like, um, save it's a 40 call on UMA and you own, you know, you own UMA tokens and, and you know, you're generally happy with them, but you, you'd say like, okay, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to sell some UMA at 40. Then you could basically mint these UMA options, lock in your UMA tokens, and then actually go out and sell this uh, this call option. And by doing that, you'll be collecting a premium for your for your options. So in that case, I think it was like six percent of an UMA. Um, so this is basically a standard like cover call type of strategy. Um, and then that would basically allow you to earn income. So if UMA doesn't get to your forty strike, you just collect that effectively. Yeah, I guess effectively that six percent in that one month time period. And if you multiply that by 12, that's you know like a 72% type of return strategy if you kept doing that. So so then people could do that. And then if UMA does get to 40, then you would have sold it anyways. But you would have sold it even at a better price. So you would have sold it for your 40 and also your extra, you know, six uh, your extra your extra like um, I guess six percent of an UMA at, at that point in time. So so then now like this gives this extra thing for our token holders to do. And they can basically be active in this options market, uh, lock in some yield, um, and, and you know, kind of also learn about financial products at the same time. And then the other thing is they, they could do, is they, they could actually, instead of actually selling the calls, they could actually be liquidity providers in it. So instead of just having like, 
you know, where other protocols just have you stake their, their tokens, like you're actually providing an actual, you know, liquid uh, derivatives market for people. Um, so you, and we, we could basically pay the UMA rewards for, for kind of farming that as well. So we, you could basically mint, your to, mint the call options, lock in your UMA tokens, mint the call options, and then pull it with your UMA and your call options, and then earn um, liquidity mining rewards on top of that. So I think once we get that fully, fully completed with a nice UI and everything, or, or, or with hopefully someone would build a nice UI for us, then I think it'd be really great for our token holders to have that opportunity to do that. Um, and, and I guess not yeah. just um, not just UMA token holders. This is just all tokens in general, right? Because you could just copy the same pattern. It's like adding another magic trick to every token that's out there. Yeah, which exactly. I think makes like everything automatically a little bit more valuable. I guess it's exactly. like okay, now you can do like LPing it. You can borrow against it, etc. Now you can sell call options really easily. I don't know how hard it was in the past. I right. guess going in one of these other systems to sell a call option against some token. Yeah, I don't, I don't, well, I don't think there are that many call options out there on other tokens, I guess, right? Yeah. But I, but I feel like this, yeah, this seems pretty easy and, and straightforward. Um, and and it, it, would, it fits perfectly for, for people who are like long-term holders and who just want to just earn some yield or, or take some profits on some stuff. And you never really lose all your UMA. It's not like you're selling your UMA tokens because it, it's all cash settle. So you actually lose a fraction of it. So they end up having still remaining UMA, which is kind of cool. And then they probably just do the same thing again. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it, it'll be kind of, it'll be really exci exciting to see what people do with it. And then in general, I, I think, you know, having these call options makes a lot of sense for DeFi projects in general, because most projects own a lot of their own tokens on their, on their treasury. Like for for example, for ourselves, like you know, we we the majority of our our treasury is UMA tokens. So this basically is it's not capital efficient, but it's a way for people to for these pro for DeFi projects to basically use those assets and do something with it that's productive, and and provide something to their community. Um, and and by creating these call options, they could use these call options for anything. Like they could instead of paying people tokens for for farming, they could pay tokens, uh, they could pay call option tokens instead, which kind of allows them to control when when their tokens are released out and also um, a specified price so that people aren't just constantly selling their tokens. And then also, of course, you can reward them to employees and, and provide them as bounties. And so there's a lot of great things I think you can do with these call options. Um, and, and the great thing about it is like, you know, if we, if we, if we do, it, do it well with UMA, then hopefully other projects will adopt it and then build the same thing. I'm gonna stop sharing. Isn't, <clears throat> isn't the proposal supposed to happen like right now? Oh yeah, that's exciting, huh? So, so Hart created some call options as a test and they actually expired right now. Um, How do yeah, we, we watch this? perfectly? Yeah. Wait, wait, like when right now? Like, like, what's what now? time exactly? Uh, uh, Unix timestamp as of a minute and twenty-five seconds ago. Yeah. Well, here we go. <laughs> um, so did, does a bot actually propose it? So it'll, it'll probably do no it idea. if it's going to do it in uh, in four minutes. It no, runs every five minutes. You have to expire the contract. Oh, we have point. to call expire on it. And, then uh, and who anyone can call expire, right? It's not it's not gated. Correct. Um, I had a question about that. Like, what if? Let me try doing that. How precise does like when does it get disputed? Like, what if someone shows a price that's like half a cent off than what it technically should be? It's a great question. Is is that <clears throat> is that worth <clears throat> disputing then? What, what you're a new token holder? What do you think? <laughs> no, I, mean, I'd I say no. I mean, I, I would say no because it's um, it's just cost. It's just that just kind of defeats the purpose. Well, it's, we want everything you know, it's, to settle uh, fast. 
I think I think really the question is like what's the threshold, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? And if you and if you set a concrete threshold and you say, oh, you know, the threshold is like half a percent, then all of a sudden everybody like every the posers all try to skew the price by 0.49% right. in their direction, right? Right. So like I think the nice thing about the way that our voting system works is like the voters could actually see that this was generated from pro from a proposal and say like uh like somebody's disputing this you know frivolously or some or this proposal was actually skewed and the dispute is valid right like the token holders can use some subjective judgment around whether to like who to reward and penalize for that dispute oh i see um i think that's kind of the idea um right although, like, this isn't worked out um it's nice to be able like it's one of those problems that i think is like kind of hard to solve strictly um in, like a, mm -hmm. in, like, a really precise way yeah. Dude, it cost me 200 bucks to expire the contract. I guess. I don't know. I've never uh, heard it before. It costs like, it's not cheap, but. Um, Wait, what? The experiment was pricey. How are you, ex like, how are you expiring it? Via like what? Like, Etherscan? Expire method. Yeah. Okay. Um, Surprise it costs that much. Well, gas is expensive right now. I oh, and better. you're also requesting a DBM price. That's why it's expensive. No price. Or yeah, yeah no price. You're right. Um, and I, maybe I'm being cheap on gas, but I'll, I'll share this transaction with the engineering team. Slack. Um, so right now, um, anybody can dispute it. Like, if there's no threshold, like if you someone just said, okay, we are off by a decimal, a fraction, then they could just dispute it if they wanted to. Yeah, the, the optimistic oracle basically, basically, um, if it's not this, if the price that's returned is not exactly the same as what the proposer proposed, then it throws, then it, then the disputer wins. Okay. So the voters, so if the voters want to like, if the voters want to penalize the disputer, if they think it wasn't that off, they should just match the, what the proposer proposed. Um, right, and it's voters, costly like, to, to do that. Like, yeah, yeah. The voters, it's, yeah, go to one. I was just gonna say, like, the voters could look at the optimus score contract and tell, like, right. Oh there. wait, I also have to pay a final fee. Is that right? To yeah. expire, this is a bond. Wait, what? The contract should pay it. Oh, the contract did pay it. Sorry, I'm just looking at the Etherscan transaction, and there was 15 UMA tokens. That's weird. Yeah, the, the contract paid the final. It just from the Etherscan transaction. It's oh. yeah, you're you're right. What happened, Chris? Did it work? Look and risk. It worked. <laughs> Good job, Nick. Isn't it amazing when you build shit that actually does what it's supposed to do? It's well, yeah. So we need to fix the good. scaling on the log a little bit, and like Unix timestamps are not super readable, but it worked. <laughs> it did the thing. And it paged me, which is great. Acknowledge. But so hold on, if the contract pays this final fee, this just gets collected. It goes to the store, right? This final fee. Correct, but you have to remember, like that gets that gets uh, that gets removed from all sponsors. Yep. Yep. Which so. I just paid 50 Numa tokens to the to the store. Yeah, but actually, there's a uh, that's actually a great something we should maybe discuss a little bit. It's kind of relevant. These options contracts, even though they're going to be big, we're collateralizing them exactly one. Oh, well, actually, it's not going to be a big deal, right? Because this thing, yeah, is, this thing is probably this thing is never going to pay out the full Numa token. So, but the sponsors are yeah. going to lose a little bit, more, like a very small fraction of their money on the on expiry because they pay the final fee. Um, yeah, it was fine. Um, that's cool. Um, cool. all right. Sh should there not have been another log? Oh, there it is. Okay. And there's errors. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> what like, are the errors? Expected, expected errors? No. No. <laughs> but it, it did propose, but. Something else happened. Can we have a price feed for this. For this, uh, what's the identifier you used? Uma USD or something? Yeah, Uma USD. Sean added it. Yeah, we. The other thing, guys, like I, before we actually make the big version of this, I want to make sure that I'm um, setting the strike correctly and that like all that math is correct because 
if I set the strike wrong or whatever, then this whole thing, it, 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 we could misprice the option. Can you right. back that out from the? Can you back that out from the payout from this contract though? No, because it expired worthless. It actually would have been better to have one in hindsight expire in the money, and then we would have been able to see. Fair enough. You know, oh. um, but maybe I can do if I do this on Covan. Like our bots don't watch Covan or anything, right? No. Most of the time, not, unless Nick is running tests. <laughs> um. Still, I think it's pretty cool, guys. To be cool. clear, I, I I built a like like this is it is kind of wild that I last night deployed a call option with Magic Internet money. Like that's a wild thought. It's real money, Magic. I didn't say it wasn't real. I said oh, it's Magic. It's just Magic. Okay. It's magic yeah. Money. <laughs> Magic's real, Kevin. Come on, oh, man. That's true. Yes. Did okay. I propose, Chris, or did the risk channel just say that a proposal, a, um, I think it says a request happened. I'm assuming that's what risk said. Yeah, that's, that's actually correct. Price request alert and then requested a price of the timestamp. And that's the address, the options contract. So I don't actually think we've done the proposal. I mean, one thing we could do potentially is like, instead of, I think we should probably like think about the alerts we want. We probably only want to alert on proposals, not on actual, not on like, not just on uh, requests. Because well, no, we want, but Matt, we do want, because we want to potentially manually propose stuff. So I do, we do want to know when a request happens. So that we right, but, but I'm saying it's not, but what I'm saying is like, I don't think we want to like wake Chris up in the middle of the night if somebody expired their contract, right? Like, I think like, I think the idea is like we should get a, we should get alerts from it, but it should be like how alerts or maybe like a, a low uh, like a yeah. message. We don't want to like have somebody getting woken up. The only time we want to have somebody w we woken up is if something potentially right. settle at a con. No, if it'll settle, if it might, if like a price is proposed and in two hours that price will be settled, and so we want to make we want to double check the price. Yeah. Well, what happens if there's a request that's never sold? Like if after a certain timeout, then we might want to have additional alerting then like if there's a price request and it hasn't been filled in like three hours or something yeah we could do yeah. something like that. you don't need to do anything complicated guys like a price request can hang out for a long time that doesn't matter in my opinion for this stuff right now yeah i mean we'll get an alert from the proposer anyway if he can propose but the proposer is the one that should be handling that and if it's having trouble proposing we'll, we'll know about it but, yeah yeah just like we do have a, a type of alerting function which is people complaining when they can't redeem their contracts right yeah it's a very it is a very effective alerting function people wait why so um anyways we're over on the call we should probably wrap but this is cool guys cool